just about to head through the gates of one of Britain's most secret military establishments, Fast Lane, on the west coast of Scotland. This is Britain's Royal Navy submarine base, and usually it would be impossible for me to get in here, especially with a television camera. But today is different. I've been vetted to the highest level, and I've had to sign the Official Secrets Act, because behind this fence is Britain's most secret and most powerful weapon of war. Security at Faslane is tight because this is the home of Britain's nuclear submarine fleet and our Trident nuclear missiles. Welcome to the most secure uh, operational base in the UK. We operate from here a nuclear deterrent for NATO and the UK and her allies. And if you've got that level of uh, sophistication, technology and power, in one place, you've really got to uh, protect it uh, and protect the knowledge that goes with it. Over six and a half thousand people work here at the base, but access to the nuclear submarines is highly controlled. After months of discussions, I've been given permission to film on board one of the UK's Trident submarines. So what happens now for me exactly? Rob, you're going to join HMS Vengeance going through the last of her training sessions before, at sea. But before we get there, we've got to go into the secure area. So I'm going to tell you to cut the camera now because you can't film inside the secure area. Oh, all right, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Some hours later, I'm being taken out into the Irish Sea, which is where I'll transfer to HMS Vengeance. I don't know where we're heading. I don't know how long I'm heading out for here. I'm feeling nervous. I don't mind if it's at all. It's there, it's right there. That is HMS Vengeance. Holy, unbelievable. Oh my word, just look at the size of it. HMS Vengeance is 150 metres long and weighs 15,000 tonnes. She's one of four Vanguard-class submarines. Am I good to go on? Yeah, if you're happy. Thank you. In just a few days, HMS Vengeance will begin her patrol where she takes over as the UK's nuclear deterrent. She'll disappear deep into the ocean in case our nuclear missiles are ever called upon. It's not heavy, it's just combustion. Happy for me to go down? Yeah, thank you. Jesus, yeah. All right, this is it then. There's no turning back now. Last breaths of fresh air. God. For four days and nights, I'll be living with the crew on the final leg of their undersea preparations. <laughs> before they head off on their tour of duty. Okay, galleys, nice days. I've already been told that I won't see everything. So much on this boat is classified as top secret. Captain Darren Mason is in charge of HMS Vengeance. It's his first time in command of a Trident submarine. You must be Rob. Hello. 
Well, come on in. I thought Rob. I'd better come in and let yeah. you know I well, am fantastic. here. Yes. Welcome to um, the submarine. Firstly, thank you very much for having me on board. No, it's fantastic to um, see you. And um, well, uh, welcome to HMS Vengeance. And so, what I thought we'd do is just show you around the submarine in a bit. But uh, first things first, to show you where we control the submarine from, affectionately known as the control room. Should we yeah. Anyway? Yeah. Thank yeah, you very much. What should I call you? What should I refer to? Uh, you as? Most of my ship's company just address me as Captain. I will call you Captain. That'd be brilliant. Rob. I will call you Rob. Please do. That is all I'm known by. <laughs> So this is the control room. It's actually the, the nerve centre of the submarine. Look at this. On the left-hand side, this is where all the information gets fed into these terminals, and then the team in front of you use their knowledge, their wisdom, and their experience to take that information to draw me, effectively, a picture of what's going on outside, all without physically seeing it. Well, it's very stable on board. It doesn't, I don't, you know, we don't feel like we're rocking around. We are gently moving, I seem to remember, through the water. Absolutely. We're going at uh, about walking pace at the moment, so uh, we're not going to outrun anyone at the moment. But, uh, she can go quite fast if she needs to, but uh, the faster we go, the more risk of detection exists. The whole idea, the whole credibility of the nuclear deterrent is stealth and slowly, slowly catching monkey. Merchant vessel, trial, starboard. Not held, sonar, uh, request target set up. And despite all the kind of screens and uh, lights and flashing lights going on around here, it is all, it was quite dark inside, isn't it? Yeah, so the only real place you're ever going to see any daylight, I'm afraid, is up on the fin, which is uh, the conning position where we navigate when we're on the surface. So if we can do it there now, and I'll, I'll show you some fresh air, perhaps the last time for a little while. <laughs> that sounds like an invitation I can't refuse. The conning tower is the highest point on a submarine. To get there, I need to climb the longest ladder on board. So I'm up for probably one of the most unique views I'll ever have in my life. But it is straight up. Oh, God. It's miles as well. Oh, knees. Right, well, Captain, you brought me up to what is almost the highest point on the boat here. Uh, it's, I mean, it's an opportunity, well, for me, anyway, to get bit of a glimpse of the scale of, of this boat. It stretches back so far. It's hard to appreciate just how big this boat is. Well, absolutely. She is undoubtedly akin to an iceberg. She is a fantastic weapon system. She's a fantastic submarine. She's also home to us all. Yeah. She looks after us, feeds us, keeps us watered and breathing safely. HMS Vengeance is home to over 160 submariners who work endless shift patterns of six hours on, six hours off. But because of the secrecy of their mission, few people on board will ever know the details. How long do you think you're going to be away from your family on this particular mission? I'll be away a while. A while? A while. We can't be any more specific than that. Not, not, no. 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 OK, that's that. And do you know where you're going to be heading off to? It's uh, somewhere down that direction, maybe left or maybe right. But uh, I know where I'm going. Very few people know where I'm going. Uh, and that is uh, obviously not a liberty to be discussed, especially to your viewers. I can continue this, this, uh, this line of question. I don't think I'm going to get any further than the, uh, the generals. Oh, yeah, Captain. Probably not. Yeah. It, uh, my, my team have a vague idea where we might be. Uh, and over time, that becomes more and more vague. And that is a whole principle of deterrent that only a very few people know where it is therefore our security and our stealth is absolute we are get Ethy Dooley sighted on the bridge our interview is interrupted be in the audible scanner give up secure the look in the star attack from us a foreign warship has been spotted approaching our location. Where, where to? From port side. And it's heading right for us. HMS Vengeance must now get underwater fast. There's a warship heading towards us and I think they're going to dive sooner than was originally planned. To get out of the way, to not be found, not be seen. Diving now, diving now. I've been given unprecedented access to HMS Vengeance, one of the Royal Navy's four Trident submarines. 
but moments after coming on board, a foreign warship has been spotted, heading straight towards us. The executive officer is Vengeance's second in command. He wants to dive the boat. This is real, this is genuine, this isn't a, a drill or anything. This is a foreign ship up there that there is a risk we would be spotted. Absolutely, and we don't want to be spotted on the surface. We want to be underneath the water where we can track her rather than she tracks us. We're not good on the surface. Where we are good is underneath the waves where we can be quiet, where we can be stealth. The captain gives the order. Navigator, dive in brief. Depth of water, 130 meters. XA, Captain, sir. Dive in submarine. Roger, ship control, diving now, what's diving now? Diving now, diving now. 24.2 meters. Under the horizon. Right 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 half down. A submarine the size of HMS Vengeance can take up to 10 minutes to completely submerge. Two down, he's in the bubble. Rise on the floor, plane. As you can hear, we've now got one degree of bow up, so the stern of the boat is beginning to sink. Put three hands off. Yeah, OK, carry on planing. Carry on planing. Happy. With the foreign warship that was nearby, is that, is that a concern at all? My objective in command of HMS Vengeance is to remain undetected at all times. Anything that's not me is not necessarily friendly. Uh, it could be a yacht. It could be a ferry, it could be a warship, any asset belonging to any country, I would try and avoid it. Yeah. West target set up on your contact, classified merchant vessel, you have left hand side. All right, fellas, let's tie then. You can, you can see, you can see the getting closer to the water. Oh, we're under. That's it, so that's our smell underwater. Roger, not hail, sonar. HMS Vengeance is now fully underwater, away from the prying eyes of the foreign warship. And I can get my first chance to properly look around. There's four decks on board, as far as I know, anyway. And I'm right in the middle here. Hello. Just chill out. Thank you. Thanks, sir. You can see all the pipes and cables and tubes all around you all the time. This is a highly complex machine. I've not been on board very long at all, and first impressions kind of reminds me of the International Space Station. All these pipes and cables and tubes and panels, all doing stuff that's obviously deeply complex. But the reality is that all of this very nearly never happened. Because just over a hundred years ago, submarines weren't taken seriously at all. In the early 20th century, Britain had the largest navy the world had ever seen. Hundreds of ships maintained an empire that stretched from Australia to Canada. But the one thing the navy had little faith in was submarines. They were notoriously dangerous and could only stay underwater for a few minutes at a time. This is Holland One, the Royal Navy's first ever submarine. She was built in Barrow in Furness in 1901 and measures just 20 metres in length. You could fit around 150 Holland Ones inside HMS Vengeance. The eight crew could barely stand and would be enveloped by exhaust fumes from the petrol engine. 
They couldn't stay underwater for long or they'd suffocate, and the risk of an explosion was high. The Royal Navy decided that compared with their massive surface ships, submarines weren't worth the effort. But other navies were less skeptical. Germany believed that stealthy subs could play a pivotal part in war. They called their submarines undersea boats, U-boats. They were faster, quieter, and safer than anything Britain had tried. Two weeks into the First World War, the Germans put them to use. A lone U-boat stalked British ships into the Firth of Four. It launched a single torpedo at a British ship, sinking her and killing over 250 of her crew. Suddenly, the submarine had become a genuine weapon of war. HMS Vengeance has the Spearfish torpedo system. With a range some 20 times greater than the one that caused so much destruction over a hundred years ago, and with much more sophisticated technology. Hey, tell me a bit more about these torpedoes, or what would you use them for? Uh, so we would use these against uh, submarine targets and ship surface targets. Uh, they're designed so that they can be guided from the submarine. In layman's terms, how big a bang would these torpedoes make? A uh, big enough bang to sink a ship, and so there's about 300 kilograms of explosives in it. Okay, so that is enough to sink quite even some of the biggest warships? Uh, yeah, there's two different methods that we can use for that. Go on then, um, what, what are they? So one is where we would, uh, it would just basically slam into the side of uh, a target, and the other is where it would explode underneath and it would um, cause an air bubble, break the back of the ship, and basically it would snap it in half and sink. But torpedoes are only one of the reasons modern submarines are now so powerful. <laughs> their ability to see underwater has revolutionised their effectiveness. It's called sonar. Now, what is sonar? How, how does it work? OK, sonar is basically the eyes and ears of the submarine, and it works by hydrophones that are set up in various locations around the submarine. And we are listening to a vessel, a merchant vessel, fishing vessel, warship, submarine, or whatever it is out there, and that noise is transmitting from that vessel onto our hydrophones, tripping onto our screen. How do you identify what that sound is? A merchant vessel, you can hear like the diesel engine rumbling on it, and you'll sometimes be able to hear the propeller moving. When it comes to warships, imagine like licking your finger and then rubbing it around the edge of a wine glass, that whiny sound. Oh, well, a high, much higher pitch. Yeah, it can be a high pitch sound, yeah. And how far away can you actually listen? How far away can you build up a picture of what else is out there? It depends on what body of water, and if you're in deep water, it could certainly go up to 100,000 yards. Un up to 100,000 yards? Yeah, 50 nautical miles. Wow. The sonar system on HMS Vengeance is a direct descendant of the technology that helped Britain in her darkest hour, the Battle of the Atlantic. In 1939, as World War II started, Britain depended on its merchant navy to bring supplies and ammunition from abroad. It was all controlled from this secret location, Western Approaches in Liverpool. And it's here that many believe World War II was actually won. This room was the command center, which coordinated the trade ships bringing goods into the UK. Hitler realised those ships were vulnerable to submarines. He ordered his U-boats to attack with devastating results. Hundreds of British ships were sunk, and it seemed like Germany might actually win the war. Winston Churchill said that German U-boats were the only things that really frightened him during the war. But it was British ingenuity that helped turn the tide. 
By 1943, a forward step in underwater technology meant the Royal Navy could track and destroy the U-boats more frequently. Today, we know this technology as sonar. Um, right, it's me here, isn't it? Yeah, that's you, yeah, come on. I'm intrigued to listen to the sounds of sonar for myself. See what I can find then. So what you listen to now is a, a merchant vessel? I'm listening to a merchant vessel. A merchant it, vessel it just sounds like fuzz. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, to the untrained ear, it'll probably sound like fuzz, but there's a bit of diesel behind it. You hear a bit of diesel from the engine. Hang on. I'm really trying to hear diesel in that. That's different. This definitely changes as I scroll through here. That sounds a lot heavier. Yeah, I think what you listen to there is it's like a large merchant vessel. If is you that... listen really carefully, you should be able to get a revolution per minute count. You listen to this, yeah. Is it kind it's of... like a rhythmic beat, yeah. That's it. This other one I found here then sounds a lot higher pitched almost. Let me see, let me see if that one. Yeah, that was yeah, it. That's, that's high pitch, and that sounds like it's going, like, like they're a revolution a lot be a, faster. It'd be a small merchant vessel or a fishing vessel. You can just move much quicker through the water. So, so, okay, yeah, there's, there's something in there's something there. Something behind it, yeah. It's something that's identifiable, but for me, it's just a con yeah. continuous noise. It is for everyone until they start doing the training properly. The younger lads will be able to classify this in no problem. So this is my first time sat at any kind of sonar system like this. How, how, how am I doing, Dale? How's... You haven't done bad, Rob, but I wouldn't give a good day job. Yeah. HMS Vengeance needs one of the most powerful sonar systems in the world because of what this submarine carries inside it. I can't quite get my head around where I'm stood. Right in the heart of HMS Vengeance, these are the missile tubes that house Trident nuclear missiles. In here are nuclear warheads. And it's surreal to stand so close to something so terrifying. Something so deadly. I'm on board the Royal Navy's HMS Vengeance submarine, which is carrying Trident nuclear missiles. To understand how we got them in the UK and why they're on board, we need to go back 50 years. By the early 60s, Britain was eager to become a nuclear power. Prime Minister Harold Macmillan flew to the Bahamas to convince President John F. Kennedy to share their nuclear missile secrets. The deal they struck became known as the Polaris Sales Agreement. Britain would be given Polaris nuclear missiles and the Americans would gain access to several Scottish locks. But a new challenge immediately arose. We needed a place to house and launch these new nuclear missiles. It was decided that the only truly secure place was deep at sea, on a submarine. 50 years ago in 1969, the British Submarine Service began carrying nuclear missiles, becoming the UK's strategic nuclear deterrent. HMS Vengeance is the latest generation of these submarines. The missiles she carries are called Trident. They're the most powerful weapon Britain has ever had. These are the Trident nuclear missiles. Trident 2, D5 nuclear missiles. Right around us. Yeah. The weapons engineering officer is responsible for looking after Trident on HMS Vengeance. How many missiles do we have on board here then, on uh, Vengeance? 
Uh, I couldn't tell you that. Okay. Up to 16. Uh, up to 16? Yeah. Do we know how many nuclear warheads we have on board? So we can have up to 40 warheads on board at any one time. So when it, when it comes to these missiles, is there any way of describing the amount of firepower that that is? I don't know, it's just, just hard to get that as a So context. Nagasaki and Hiroshima, if you think of those, yeah. there's more than both of them put together around us now. Wow. Do you ever get used to the fact that you're living and working around the most deadly weapons ever created? That's quite sobering for me, stood here. I don't know how that is for you. Yeah, it's... Yeah, it is. If it came to them, once you actually press fire, what actually happens with these missiles? How do they work? So, once the trigger's pressed, the hatch will open. Once that opens, the missile launches up into space, then the bombs, so to speak, will fall out to the targets. You are part of that process, are you, that firing? Well, I'm, I'm the end of the firing chain, yes. Ultimately, on the end of the trigger, starts with the Prime Minister, finishes with me. The nuclear deterrent must always be ready to fire on the orders of the Prime Minister, and at a moment's notice. Battle stations at battle stations at battle stations missile for training without guidance with the launcher simulating WSRT. The crew test the nuclear missile firing procedure on a regular basis. All possession secure from returning to periscope there. Roger. Set condition one SQ for training without guidance with launcher. Captain Darren Mason is authorised to test fire Trident. Snap con, Roger. What, 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 what is actually going on here? OK, so uh, for this, we're simulating a uh, weapon system readiness test, which is proving to the outside authorities that the weapon system is fit incredible for its task, which is required to do. So the weapon system, we're talking about our ballistic missile system, the deterrent. Our nuclear deterrent. And by doing so, we've gone to Battle Stations Missile, which was the uh, general alarm, the angry doorbell, as we call it. Why is it important to do this exercise? Well, if we didn't do the exercise, we wouldn't know it works. The encrypted order to test fire is transmitted to HMS Vengeance and given to two of her most senior officers. The order is printed and carried to the control room in plain sight, so there's no possibility it can be interfered with. Then, behind a screen, its contents are decoded. So the doctor's just given me the latest update of the uh, target package that's owned in the computer. I have just been given the assurance that my understanding of what's going on in the submarine's computer systems, which are held in my little black book, which yes. unfortunately you can't look at, uh, is exactly the same as being held in the weapon system. So by comparing and trusting this and my black book, I know categorically the weapon system is going to do exactly what I expected to do. So four by three meters. Come on. I can't in one SQ. Come on in one SQ. Ship in one SQ. So the submarine's now been brought up to a certain launch depth. We've been slowed down. We're now ultimately stopped. Mm. This 13,000 ton submarine is physically stopped in the water, hovering, which meant at 1840 on this clock on the top, we will be able to uh, be ready in all respects to simulate a strike. And for the purposes of this exercise, you will give that command, will you? I will give that command. With the final checks made, the weapons engineering officer can pull the test trigger. Weapons con. My permission to fire your one SQ report. Con weapons. Weapon system ready for strategic launch. Weapons con. Launching condition one SQ for strategic launch. Launching condition one SQ for strategic launch. Launching weapons, Roger. If it came to it then, have you thought through how you might feel if you had to pull that trigger, that final trigger? That's my job. I've worked a long time to get here. Uh, and if I wasn't going to do what I was ordered, then I wouldn't be here. 
weapon has my permission to fire. 10 seconds to launch. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Fire! 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 Bomb away! Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Away, yeah. Yeah. Away, permission to fire removed. Yeah, we're done. The, the test is now complete. Taking the submarine back down to a safe depth and ultimately carrying on with our patrol. When would you know, in the case that this was a real scenario, God forbid, when would you know it's the time to fire, to give your order to fire? That's a very good question. So these things don't just happen. There would be a significant escalation or deterioration of political instability. Yeah. Uh, we would notice that extra units of the uh, Royal Navy were at sea. There'd be a whole narrative of the story developing. I would expect, I would be anticipating that the order to launch might be occurring. With it comes this enormous responsibility. How well does that sit with you as, as a person? Um, it, it's not a conversation I routinely have with people. It is a job I am expected to do. I'm trusted to hold those keys. I'm trusted to deliver that capability. But I have absolute confidence that when I'm tasked to deliver that effect, that decision is made in good faith by the right people, with the right intelligence, with the right outcome in mind. I am simply the tool that delivers that capability. Before today, I've never fully contemplated the end of the world. But actually, if it were to happen, it would play out almost exactly as I've just seen. Surrounded as I am by these weapons of mass destruction, it would fall to the people I've met on here to carry out this most horrific of orders. That's what resonates with me and what I find difficult to reconcile that the crew on this sub help keep us all safe every single day, but they also hold this terrifying destructive power, an unimaginable responsibility. For 50 years, they've patrolled in silence, but it would only take one day and one act to end life on Earth as we know it. There's no rest for the crew today. On the back of the Trident firing drill, the fire alarm sounds. A fire can cripple a submarine and burn up precious oxygen. Get that down. Go the fire. I've got it. Go. The fire's are, and the atmosphere is in state, and the submarine is safe. Fortunately, this was a drill. Welcome to day two of safety. But the crew's response is reviewed as if it were real. When the fire pipe came out, the noise level starts to increase, but considering the amount of people in here right now, the noise levels very quickly drop back down again to a manageable level and the team effort in here, you know, they're all backing each other up, which is good to see. The crew did well, but it wasn't perfect. Okay. Safety must always be the captain's primary concern. I worry about the material state of the submarine. I worry about the, the, the well-being of my ship's company. I have 167 people who look to me to give them their assurance and their safety, and that's my job. Just gone 9 o'clock in the evening. And I have to keep looking at my watch because there's no other means to tell you, there's no daylight. It's just such an alien environment. Well, that's been an insight into what happens on board. I'm absolutely knackered just from taking everything in. But I'm quite looking forward to waking up in the morning because there's so much more about this sub that I still want to understand. Moments after we finish filming, the general alarm sounds again, but this time, it's for real. There's a leak in the engine room, an area of the boat that's off limits to our cameras. Obviously, we're in training at the moment, so 
I didn't know if it's a training evolution or not. Uh, it isn't. It's a ring evolution. Uh, it's been a hydrated leak and um, it stops undergoing a lot of training at the moment. It's very hard to determine what's real and what's not. As the leak is frantically being plugged, I stumble across the man who discovered it. He's been moved to a safe compartment. What did you see? What did you, uh, how, did you, how did you? A spray of uh, hydraulic oil. You could smell it in the air before you got there. Quite intense. As soon as you got down by the trap, so you knew it was coming from there. So I just grabbed a rag and dived in and uh, stopped the hydraulic uh, turning into a mist because that's when it's at the most dangerous. So it was all over me, all over my hair, and you could just taste it in the atmosphere. Are you all right? Yeah, yeah, good. My shoulder's yeah. a bit sore. Um, what is, what's that? Did you... I think I cracked it as I went in for the for the leak site. Wow. Listen, mate, um, let, go and make sure you get yourself sorted out. The engineer's quick thinking stopped the leak from turning into a fire. But the boat's hydraulics are now compromised. Well, your worst case is that you have everything on the one hydraulic system. If the crew can't find a solution underwater, they'll have to return to port, making them late for their nuclear deterrent patrol. Fixing this problem is now top priority. So we can't fix this in a minute, you think? I'm doubtful we can fix it. HMS Vengeance is at emergency stations in the middle of the night. It's suffered a hydraulic leak that's just been plugged, but it's left the submarine vulnerable. I don't think in this line of we could or should attempt to be people on it. Senior officers must decide what to do. Either they trust the quick fix they've just done to hold for the next few months at sea, or delay their mission and head home. So we can't fix this in a minute, you think? I'm doubtful we can fix it. It is an abnormal lineup, so. so the worst case would be uh, another uh, an issue with starboard main um, reduce you even further um, and more hydraulic So what happens now? We brief the captain that is now a plan going in place, which means that we revert some of our systems, albeit to an abnormal lineup, it's still a safe lineup, and the submarine will still work as it normally would. Which means that you can continue on. Um, on as as was planned with the sub, just Absolutely. with backup systems. Yep. Just a backup system for the main system, and there's a backup system for the backup system. It's all built on a reversionary mode, so it's just about picking the right one. It's never a dull moment, is that? There is not. No, I did have my head down at that stage as well. I was fast asleep, and uh, it gives you a bit of a fright. <laughs> I can share that, likewise. <laughs> yeah. The decision has been made to continue the mission. The following day, there's some bad news for the engineer who found the leak. What do you think you've done? What, what, or what have you been told? Uh, the, the doc said I might have fractured my collarbone. Um, I don't know, but I just know I want to show the agony. So what does this mean for you and the patrol that's um, quickly coming up? They're going to try and get me off as soon as they can. My own, uh, operations to do like hang it off. How does that feel for you, being a bit disappointed? Being stood down. This is my first um, qualified uh, bit, of sea, bit of sea time. I did Cat A2, so I've only done about 10 days up to now, and now this is our The engineer's quick response prevented a fire in HMS Vengeance's engine room. 
but his injury means his time on board is now over. And my four days and nights on the submarine are also coming to an end. So the submarine's just surfaced, which means that I can take a peek through the periscope. There's a horizon there, which is something I've not seen for a fair while. It's actually quite a pertinent moment, though, because I'm very aware that as my visit here on the start draws to a close, the crew's mission is just beginning. And this is as close to home as they're going to get for a good few months. Once I leave, HMS Vengeance will head out on patrol along with her nuclear deterrent. For the crew, their mission has only just started. To have to spend weeks, months, maybe out at sea, away from normal life, away from family and friends and loved ones, I think I'd find really, really difficult. Really, really difficult. It is the people that make the submarine. It's a family make the submariner uh, driving away from the house. I would lie to you if I didn't stop the car and I don't ever think about it. Mm. And a few uh, leaky eyeball moments, mm. and then unfortunately you have to accept your divinity and, and, and move on. The weekly highlight for everyone on board will now be a short message from loved ones at home. Even that's censored, and there's no means to reply. It's certainly not a life I could lead. For over 50 years, Royal Navy submariners have secretly kept our nuclear deterrent at permanent readiness. But these boats are now ageing. So whatever we might feel about the nuclear deterrent, its future is already decided. Will there be a next 50 years of at-sea deterrent for the UK, do you think? Well, I'm going to say, perversely, sadly, we are planning that. Mm. You know, and I say that because nobody wants nuclear weapons, really. And the same as we want a blue planet free of plastics. You know, but we are planning on having uh, a, a nuclear deterrent capability for the next 50 years. You know, we have a new submarine being built in the HMS Dreadnought be far more sophisticated than Vengeance. Looking back on my few days on board, I've been astonished by what I've seen. Weapons has my permission to fire. Two, one, all away. It's been a bewildering and moving experience, but it's focused my mind on what HMS Vengeance really is. For me, HMS Vengeance is a real paradox. As an engineering masterpiece, it is one of the most complex technical creations mankind has ever accomplished, and it's certainly thrilling. But at the same time, it is the deadliest of weapons. And if it were ever called into use, it would likely represent the end of life as we know it. Either way, it does exist. And I can't imagine it being in better hands. The people I met down on HMS Vengeance are amongst the most capable I've ever met. And if we are to have this kind of weapon for the next 50 years, these are exactly the kind of people to run it. Brand new How Britain Won World War Tape takes an in-depth look back at some of the key turning points of the conflict. That's next Wednesday at 8. Next tonight, shooting a daring new video and partying in the wildest way imaginable. It's adults only here on Channel 5.